Hey everyone, Louis here from the Ideas Matter podcast, coming at you today in a YouTube video for the first time. Now, the purpose of this YouTube channel, uh, which I hope will keep going from here, is to supplement the podcast rather than replace it. I'll be uploading shorter videos that will be more explanatory in nature rather than critical which is sort of more the focus of the podcast, um, really doing a deep dive into a text and getting underneath it and discussing what we think is wrong with it or what works with it. Rather, this these videos will be much shorter, 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes long, and they'll be much more expository. Um, so they're very much a supplement to the podcast. And if you haven't listened to the podcast yet, there'll obviously be a link in the description below. Um, but without further ado, today I want to just talk briefly about John Rawls, A Theory of Justice. Now, those of you who've listened to the podcast will know that I'm certainly not reading this book out of any particular love for liberalism, um, rather quite the opposite. But you, you really can't understand the history of Anglo-American political theory in the late 20th century without grappling with John Rawls. Uh, that's because in response to his Theory of Justice, which was published in 1971, I think, off the top of my head, um, you had on the right uh, people responding to it. So Robert Nozick published Anarchy, State, Utopia, in which he defends a much more minimalist conception of the state, in contrast to John Rawls, who's, I guess, a progressive liberal. He favours a welfare state. But then on the left, you had it also being critiqued by people like Michael Sandel, Alastair McIntyre, and Michael Walzer, and particularly um, Michael Sandel's book, Liberalism and the Limits of Justice, is a direct response to Rawls, and the publication of that book kicked off what's been called the liberal communitarian debate in Anglo-American philosophy, which was very big in the 80s, somewhat so in the 90s. Today, it's not as big, but it's a very, very important debate which is essentially, I guess, to oversimplify it, to what extent should we understand politics as being about individuals or, as the name implies in communitarianism, about communities? What's the correct unit of analysis and unit of normative concern in, po in political theory? Is it individuals as per liberalism and rules or is it communities? But regardless, um, let's get back back to rules. So certainly rules didn't write this book with the foreknowledge that it would generate this huge debate in academic political philosophy. Rather, he wrote the book to counter what he saw as the dominance of utilitarianism in political and ethical theory um, prior to the 1970s. Now, utilitarianism is basically just an ethical theory which states that the goal of a society should be the maximization of utility. And in the classic version of this, so say Sidgwick, uh, utility is defined as the, satis the satisfaction of desires. So on a very classical utilitarian model, the goal of society should be to maximize people's satisfaction of desires. Now, this is problematic to liberals like rules uh, because utilitarianism provides no theoretical defense for the idea of individual rights or liberties. Hypothetically, if we could structure society in such a way, <clears throat> excuse me, where 90, 95% of the population had their desires max maximized, maximally satisfied, at the expense of 10, 5% of the population who had their basic liberties or rights violated in order to do that, then on a purely utilitarian standpoint, that would be what you would have to accept. But that violates our very basic intuition that people in some sense have a basic equality, a basic right to certain equal liberties. And that idea that intuition, I should say, is very central to the liberal project, to the democratic project. So Rawls wants to provide a defense of that, <clears throat> but not just by relying on intuition. He wants to update 
In his own words, he sees himself as updating the social contract theory of Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau by carrying it to a higher level of abstraction and showing that it's actually rational for people to accept principles of justice, which I'll outline in a sec, but principles of justice that recognize a basic minimum that everyone is entitled to certain equal liberties, which can't be violated. So what do I say when he updates the social contract and takes it to a higher level of abstraction? Now, if you're familiar with Hobbes or Locke to any basic extent, you'll know that both these thinkers argue that people exist as individuals in a state of nature, but they decide to come together and form a society because in forming a society, we get greater benefits than we were by ourselves. Hobbes focuses more on protection from violence, so security, whereas Locke really sees us as coming together in society as being able to fully maximize our freedoms um, through the avenue of society. So Rawls agrees with that. Uh, Society is a system of mutual benefit, he writes, where individuals come together to cooperate in a shared scheme. But this raises the question, what principles regulate this this is social venture. How do we regulate society? Rawls is concerned with finding the principles which regulate the benefits and burdens of society. So these benefits, this extra wealth that we get by socially cooperating, how do we distribute that in a way that is just? Again, the utilitarian would say, whatever distribution maximally satisfi- satisfies our desires, even if that means 5-10% of the population are basically serfs. Uh, Rawls does not think that this would be a just distribution because he doesn't think that individuals would accept this in social contract theory. So when he takes the state of nature to a higher level of abstraction, he is referring to his conceptual device, the original position. And this is probably where most people have heard of Rawls. He says, look, imagine a group of individuals in the original position The original position is original because it's before the social and natural contingencies, say someone's born smarter, fitter, etc., or someone has rich parents and they get to go to a better school. These things, these contingencies, which are morally irrelevant, according to rules, they exert their distorting influence on our basic level of equality and create inequalities in society. So he doesn't want us to negotiate the principles of justice from these positions of inequality. He wants to take us back to the original position, which is, of course, purely hypothetical, but it's an original position of equality where everyone is a free and equal moral person. He says we should negotiate the principles that are going to regulate society from this original position. Moreover, no one knows what position in society they're going to have. So when we're in the original position, we're also behind what Rawls calls the veil of ignorance. You don't know, once you agree to live in a certain society, whether you're going to be rich, poor, male, female, from an ethnic majority, an ethnic minority, etc. You, you have no idea where you're going to land in this society. So Rawls thinks that this position, this original position, and this veil of ignorance are fair conditions. And so any principles of justice agreed to regulate society from these fair conditions will be accepted. So this is what he means when he says his theory of justice is justice as fairness. It's principles of justice chosen under conditions which he believes to be fair because they reflect our intuition that everyone has a certain basic moral equality, regardless of how social and natural contingencies affect our actual material equality in society. Now, straight off the bat, he says, anyone in this original position behind a veil of ignorance is not going to accept utilitarianism as a principle which structures society. Because if I don't know where I'm going to land in this society, why would I accept the principle of utility? Because I could easily be in the 10, 5% of society that has their rights violated in order to maximize the utility of the majority. So it wouldn't be rational for me to assent to the principle of utility. Now, just a quick word on the idea of rationality here. Rawls takes it as a given that A, uh, people are individuals, 
but B, that individuals are self-interested in that they want to pursue their own conception of the good, their own conception of the good life. So I have an idea about how best to organize my life. You guys have an idea, I hope, of how best to organize your life. Liberal states are neutral on which one of our conceptions is better than the other. But nonetheless, it says that we all have a conception of the good and we're rational insofar as we want the means to pursue our conceptions of the good. So if we're behind the veil of ignorance, we don't really know who we are in any particular sense. It also stands to reason that we don't know what our conception of the good is yet. So how do we structure a society in which we can be self-interested? We want to maximize for ourselves what Rawls calls primary social goods. And you can just think about these as the means to which we pursue any given end, regardless of what that end is. He says, primary social goods are the things that everyone wants more of, provided that they're rational, okay? So that's literally just things like freedoms, income, wealth, certain basic conditions like education, housing, etc. Those things which actually make it possible to pursue however we define our theory of the good life. So with those assumptions in place, we wouldn't choose a principle of utility because it might end up so that we can't pursue our theory of the good in this state. We would, however, agree to two principles of justice, uh, which Rawls outlines. And they are, firstly, uh, that each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive total system of basic liberties compatible with a similar system of liberty for all. So all that means is that we would agree to a society in which it gave everyone as much freedom as it could give to individuals before that individual freedom started to impact on other people. This is very, very similar to John Mill's harm principle, which is basically you're free to do whatever you want provided you're not harming other people. Because once you start harming other people, you're taking away someone else's freedom. So it's a pretty simple idea. The second principle is, it comes in two parts. Social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are both A, to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged, consistent with the just savings principle, and B, attached to offices and positions open to all under conditions of fair equality and opportunity. So there are your two principles of justice. The second one is interesting uh, because Rawls is quite explicitly allowing inequality to exist in a just society with the stipulation that it has to be to the least advantaged. Now, this is quite interesting because you can take this in a number of ways. There's a kind of lazy critique of Rawls that a theory of justice sort of provides a, a theoretical rationalization for neoliberalism. And you can kind of see how this makes sense because the classic defense of neoliberalism is for something like trickle-down economics. If we let the rich get really, really rich, that wealth will trickle down, it will benefit the bottom. So that sort of seems to be what Rawls is saying. And he actually does quite explicitly give that example in the book. And he doesn't say whether he thinks it's true. He says this might be true, it might not be true, but for it to be ethically defensible, uh, you, that's the kind of argument you would have to make. You would have to justify any economic inequality insofar as it was demonstrated to be of benefit to the least advantaged in society. So you can kind of read it as a, as a justification of neoliberalism, but I think if you take it in the context of what Rawls is saying, I don't really think that's fair because he says we should regard society and we should regard the natural distribution of talents. So some people are naturally going to be born smarter or more athletic than others, which will lend itself to economic inequalities. And some people are going to be born disabled. That's just natural reality. But rather we should regard this natural distribution of talents as a common pool of assets for the benefit of everyone. So if you are if you just happen to be born really naturally athletic and you have a successful, successful career, 
making millions as an athlete. Those talents are not just yours. They actually belong to a pool, to a social pool. And those talents ought to be exercised to the benefit of everyone. And he actually says that the most advantaged in society would would actually recognize this as rational because they would recognize that for them to enjoy these inequalities, for you to have the life of a professional athlete or someone who's fortunate enough to uh, get to sit around reading philosophy books all day, for example, that your ability to do that depends upon other people in society doing work that you don't have to do. So we can't actually enjoy these inequalities unless there are other people in society doing certain things. So it would be rational for the more advantaged person to accept some limit, some upper limit on how unequal everything is to even everything out, to benefit the least advantaged. Because if we didn't accept that society would be unstable, it would breed resentment at the bottom But it's ultimately self-defeating. It's contradictory because we can't have these advantages unless we all work together. So Rawls actually argues that he does kind of argue that society is a sort of collective venture, which is not very neoliberal as I understand it. And he does constrain markets. He does have a sort of a social moral purpose, which constrains the free reign of markets, which pure neoliberalism doesn't have. So all of this is just to say I don't I don't think it's fair to critique rules as providing a kind of rhetorical uh, veneer for neoliberalism. I mean, that would just be a lazy reading of rules, in my opinion. So we've got these two principles of justice. Um, now it's worth asking, what are those principles applying to? You'll note that Rawls is not providing a sort of individualistic ethical theory. He's not he's not talking to individuals about how they should best live their day-to-day lives. The subject of justice for Rawls is what he calls the basic structure of society. Now, the basic structure of society is those principles which regulate the sum total of all the major social institutions. So if you live in a liberal democracy like I do... Australia, uh, you have like a constitution, you'll have parliaments, you'll have courts, uh, you'll also have free markets. So he also takes like functionings as free markets to be institutions. How these institutions function, how those things are regulated, that's what the principles of justice are designed for. They regulate these major institutions. So the principles of justice are actually above and beyond a constitution, for example they would decide prior to writing the constitution what makes a constitution fair. So again, Rawls thinks that these major social institutions have to attempt as best they can to instantiate these principles of justice. And if we agree that these principles of justice are fair, then they're not open to revision. There's nothing above and beyond that we can appeal to. He even says quite explicitly, like, you can't appeal to God to say, well, you know, my personal religion wouldn't agree to these principles of justice. No, for rules, these are abs- these are final. They're the final court of appeal, if you like. You can only critique, say, the functioning of a parliament, of a constitution, of any major social institution on the basis of how well does it instantiate our principles of justice. So if you live in a liberal democracy, for example, you're basically your only critique available to you that makes sense, according to rules, is to critique it imminently, to critique it using the logic of liberal democracy itself. You can't say, I don't like liberal democracy because I don't believe in people's fundamental freedoms. That's not rational, according to rules. But you can say, hey, as society currently stands, we're not living up to our ideals of everyone having equal basic liberties, of inequalities only existing insofar as they benefit the least advantaged. So the principles of justice are are our moral benchmark, so to speak, by which we determine how well our major social institutions are faring. Now, I actually think the best defense Rawls provides for these principles of justice about why they would be chosen by rational, free and equal persons in the original position behind a veil of ignorance, 
why these principles will be chosen is because Rawls makes this interesting argument, which I'm inclined to agree with, that everyone has a higher order interest in securing for themselves self-respect. Everyone wants to have self-respect because for me to pursue my theory of the good life, for example, I have to think that my theory of the good is worthy of respect and I have to self-respect myself to want to pursue it. Now, from here, he says that it's easier to respect yourself when you feel respected by others. And so there's kind of a virtuous circle going on here, wherein if I feel respected by other people, I'm more likely to respect myself. And then he says people who have self-respect are generally less envious towards other people and are also more likely to respect other people. And I think this is intuitively pretty self-evident. I mean, people who are happy and pursuing their theory of the good generally don't hate on other people what they're doing, even if they're doing something very, very different to how they would spend their life, because they recognize, hey, that person is doing what they take to be in their best interests to pursue their theory of the good. I'm doing the same, more power to them. So Rawls thinks that a society which has self-respecting individuals is much more stable because it doesn't breed resentment and it doesn't uh, breed envy. So how do you create a system which produces this self-respect? Well, he says you need to embed this respect for others into the principles of justice. And so justice is fairness. These two principles of justice does this because their whole point is to secure, firstly, a basic minimum for everyone. So that's your basic liberties. But secondly, it's neutral on your conception of the good. It's just trying to maximize your primary social goods. It's trying to maximize your ability to accumulate the means to pursue whatever ends you want. It doesn't take a stand on what ends are more desirable. So this is sometimes called liberal neutrality, right? Um, now Rawls thinks that this embeds a respect for other people in the very principles of justice in a way that utilitarianism doesn't. Because if we live in a utilitarian society, the overarching principle is just the maximization of utility. Now, I might be very fortunate living in a utilitarian society, but any benefits I enjoy under a utilitarian scheme are provisional. That is to say, they could be changed like that tomorrow if it turns out that in that in altering my life prospects, we're able to maximize the benefit of society as a whole. So I don't have any ga basic guaranteed minimum in a utilitarian society. And my knowledge of that, my knowledge that my life prospects are provisional, open to revision, not enshrined in law, makes me feel that I'm not respected by the state. I don't feel respected as an individual. And again, Rawls says everyone has a higher order interest in preserving this respect for themselves. So the principles of justice, he argues, by enshrining this respect, actually create a society which generates its own self-support. It is more stable in the long run because it creates respect for others and individuals with self-respect. So he again, argues that it's more rational than utilitarianism because it's going to be more stable in the long run. So there we have it. We have the reasons why Rawls thinks that free and equal persons behind a veil of ignorance would assent to structuring their society along the principles of justice. Justice is fairness. The most extensive scheme of basic equal liberties for all and only allowing inequalities if those inequalities are to the benefit of the least advantaged. That is the most rational system. Now, I just want to close by saying a few things about, I guess, the epistemic conditions. So when Rawls says rational people would agree to this, what does he mean by that? Um, he acknowledges, obviously, that the original position has never existed, can never exist. It's rather a heuristic device. So we're supposed to be able to put ourselves into the original position at any given point in time and therefore rationally deduce, oh, yep, I can see 
by putting myself behind the veil of ignorance, I can see why rules, rules is correct. Now, this is important because rules is saying uh, these principles of justice would be accepted by what he terms a considered judgment. So if you were to just walk up to someone in the street or talk to a bad faith actor, I guess someone being paid to promote an alternative theory, they're not exercising considered judgments. They're biased beyond what is ordinarily possible to prevent. So they're biased in favor of a certain theory of justice. These are not the people that Rawls is saying can be convinced by the original position. He's talking about us exercising considered judgments. So sitting back, reflecting on these principles, trying to put ourselves into the original position. He thinks when we do this, then we will see that the principles of justice as fairness are indeed the most rational way to organize society. But more than that, uh, he's, he thinks that in a reflective equilibrium, our considered judgments will reflect the principles of justice as fairness. So what is a reflective equilibrium? First, everyone has an inbuilt intuitive sense of justice. He sort of asserts this as fact, that we intuitively feel things to be either just or unjust. We then partake in considered judgments about those intuitions. So someone might say, well, how do your intuitions feel about this? Is this just? And maybe you say no. And then they go, well, hang on, but consider X, Y, and Z. And then you'll consider. And you go, well, actually, after that argument, I see now that I need to refine my intuitions or that intuition A was clashing with intuition B. And in this case, I should give precedence to intuition B. And so after a considered judgment, I accept your theory of justice. A reflective equilibrium is when someone presents utilitarianism on the one hand, a theory of justice is fairness on the other hand, then another theory of justice. So maybe a theological Aristotelian theory of justice, where the point of society is to maximize someone's potential, etc. Think of every possible theory of justice that you could come up with. People give you all these theories. They give you all the reasons that they can possibly muster for these theories. And then you sit back and you're in a reflective equilibrium. You take your intuitions, you listen to the arguments for each theory. Your intuitions are refined, discarded, or perhaps you keep to them. And you go through all these philosophical theories. And so at the end of this process, you have highly refined intuitions and you've considered all these different theories. You're in a reflective equilibrium. From this position, Rawls thinks that people would choose his two principles of justice. They are superior to any alternative theory in that they best match our intuitive sense of justice. So this is quite interesting because it's actually quite, it's a, it's a highly reflexive theory. It's at once acknowledging that what Rawls is trying to do is to justify certain intuitions that we already have by creating a conceptual device and then a theory that comes along with it. So he's acknowledging that he's in a sense putting the horse before the cart. But he says once we get this theory, then we sort of look back and adjust our own intuitions. So it's highly it's highly reflexive and you can't necessarily dismiss rules by saying, well, you've designed the original position in such a way to create the answer you want. He would say, yeah, that's exactly what I have done, deliberately so, uh, because he, he thinks that the philosophical ideal is a reflective equilibrium, which necessarily must start from our intuitions. But he says, well, this philosophical ideal of having all the available alternatives to you, your intuitions, and then your refined intuitions. Obviously, we can never get to a perfect reflective equilibrium, but we can get as close as possible. And in doing so, uh, we would accept his principles of justice. So this is obviously a highly ambitious theory and a highly ambitious philosophical project. Uh, he says that the principles of justice are universal in that they are applicable to any human society at any point in time, at any level of development. So this is a very, very bold statement. Um, so I'd be interested in, in hearing 
whether you guys agree with rules. Do you think the most rational society that we can construct is one that follows rules as two principles of justice? That everyone has equal basic liberties compatible with the most extensive scheme for others? And that the only equalities that are defensible or justifiable are those inequalities which benefit others? Um, does Rawls's project succeed in basically showing that progressive liberalism, welfare state liberalism, which, mind you, this is written in the 1970s, so it's as the sort of welfare state is waning and neoliberalism is emerging, right, is this a successful defense of welfare state liberalism in theoretical terms, or does it fail? What do you think?